Welcome to Diffuse Congruence, the American Muslim Experience. This is episode 110, and we are delighted to be back. Uh, we are recording a couple of weeks before Ramadan, and uh, Omar, uh, welcome back as well, and uh, how have you been? Uh, hey, Sonic and Pervez. Um, yeah, I'm doing good. It's April. I can't believe it. Uh, life is starting to get back to normal. I got uh, my first shot. So yeah, things are things are all right. When, and hey, Ramadan's around the corner. So yeah, you've got you've got one shot in your arm. How, 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 any kind of side effects or anything like that? You, you feel anything? Uh, yeah, I got a little sick, but it was, it was, it was all right. <laughs> it, was, gotcha. it was worth it. Yeah. I had, I had yeah, to yeah. drive out, drive out like at the middle of California to get like a, a last minute shot that I, that came available. So, but I took, it was like, hey, it's probably worth the drive. I got to go back now in like three and a half yeah. weeks. Right. But, uh, Hey, yeah. it's all yeah. good. Uh, now, do, now do you have to go all the way back to the same location where you got Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. So for, sure. For, for, for those listening, not native to California, um, it, it, I think they, they've announced that April 15th, um, anybody like basically 16 and over, uh, is eligible. And so, but I imagine that's going to be a pretty massive amount of people. So we'll see what, what that rollout looks like. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's good to be back. And like you're saying, uh, things are opening back up and movie theaters are opening back up. And that kind of leads us to, uh, to our guest today, uh, who is actually a returning guest, and that is Lena Khan. Uh, Omar, why don't you tell us a little bit about Lena, and then uh, we'll welcome Lena officially back to the show. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're super ha- happy to have Lena on the show. Lena is a Canadian-American writer and director. Her first feature film, The Tiger Hunter, released in over 60 cities nationwide and garnered very positive reviews from the New York Times, the LA Times, and more. Uh, and fresh off her first film, Disney tapped Lena to direct Flora and Ulysses a live action family comedy that's currently on Disney plus. Uh, so if you haven't seen it yet, do check it out um, with a background from the UCLA school of theater, film and television and experience at noted production companies, such as participant media. Uh, Lena spent years directing short films, commercials, music videos before embarking on her first film. Uh, Lena and her work have been profiled in Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, Teen Vogue, USA Today, and the New York Times. She was listed as one of the 25 screenwriters to watch in Movie Maker Magazine. Um, and she has sold in the past two years two television shows, completed production on Flora and Ulysses. And actually, as I mentioned, it's 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 available for streaming on Disney Plus. I will plug it again <laughs> throughout the show. Uh, and she's currently overseeing development by a prestigious and delightfully kooky writer for a screenplay she will direct, which we will definitely ask about uh, and try to get the scoop on uh, to the extent that we can. So, Lena, welcome. We're super happy to have you on. Uh, welcome back, I should say. I know you were on an, an episode back in 2017 when The Tiger Hunter was uh, in theaters um, and uh you talked to Pervez as well as Zucky, the previous host of the show, who has since uh, left the movie film. Uh, I should say, left the movie film podcast. He he's gone to the movie film podcast, his own podcast, and he's left Diffuse Congruence. Uh, and I joined about uh, you know a year and a half ago. But uh, and regardless, happy to super happy to have you on, and uh, happy to excited to have this conversation. Yeah, nice to be here. Yeah, you know, uh, so Lena, like I, I, I imagine listeners can go back and listen to the uh, previous episode we had with you, where I know we delved deep into your personal background, your life story. Uh, but if you want to maybe just do a, like a quick, uh, you know, like a synopsis, if you will, and then we have a ton of questions we want to talk about uh, in terms of picking up your journey from where we left things off with uh, the release of The Tiger Hunter. And and uh, you, this is the, the one time, Pervez, where you should have used the term Superhero origin. We got a we got a fellow uh, a fan, you know, comic book uh, <laughs> right. auto here. So you 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 could you could have used the the superhero origin. So that is uh, so true. Uh, and for anyone who's seen the movie, for anyone who's seen the movie, uh, for, for Flora and Ulysses, um, know that uh, superheroes and uh, comic books feature a very prominent part of the movie. So you're yeah. right, Omer. I was uh, remiss, if you will, <laughs> not, not to include that, which is another catchphrase here at Diffuse Congruence. So uh, yeah. Tell Tell us about the origin story, but uh, the way comic books do when people already know the origin story from way back. <laughs> That's awesome. It's like whenever I have a, when you set up general meetings with the studios and things like that, they're always like, tell us about yourself. Tell us everything. And I'm like, where, what part do you actually want to know? <laughs> That's right. Um, no, I'm good. I, I um, see. Fast forward, I grew up in Canada. I fast forward. Although the Canada thing ends up being very useful career wise. Canada, it turns out like, 
has these all these articles out now. They're like Canadian American um, filmmaker, and I was like, I only lived in Canada for like six months, but I um, I don't I don't mind being claimed by Canada. I love Canada, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Grew up here, went to UCLA, went to film school, went to participant, uh, and did a little bit of development there. Had um, started with doing a bunch of like. Music videos for anybody who would hire me. Those in like Muslim community will know like the folks like Kareem Salama and Maher Zayn did a lot of those videos. Um, it's helpful to do videos because they pay you for your work. So you, yeah. get, you get to practice instead of having to like raise money for short films all the time. So um, little, known, little known fact that our listeners may not know, but Omar is like a huge Kareem Salama fan. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, yeah, yeah. Really? It, it, I, I am, I am. I, not, 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 I haven't heard much lately. lately. I haven't really kept up, but the first, that first two album, albums? right? The that first, first album is the first is two albums. Oh yeah, the, okay. the first two albums. And you did yeah. the video for Generous Peace, correct? Yeah. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Great video, by the way. I love it yeah. with the whole cafeteria uh, yeah. harassment and, and the boxing and all that, right? You did that? Yeah, yeah. That's right. Awesome. That that is a gem of an album if there ever was one. It's it just, really that, is. got so much soul and poetry and somehow makes you like country music. It's weird. You know, yeah. really, it's funny, like, uh, like my, 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 my story sort of interconnects or intertwines with, with Kareem's in the sense that he was actually uh, a, a Houstonian or at least living in Houston. Um, after I think he released his first album, he went back to like practicing law. I mean, he was a lawyer turned country singer, <laughs> which he probably does a phrase you don't hear very often. Um, so yeah, I think he was like in-house counsel for like a big oil and gas company. So uh, not to break any, not to kind of like shatter any illusions. Um, but uh, that was, you're right though. It was a powerful first album. And I remember that video well, not even knowing that you did that, Lena. And I think we were, again, remiss, if you will, for not uh, bringing that up on the last episode. So um, folks can definitely uh, YouTube, uh, go to YouTube and search, uh, yeah, um, that it's video and check Generous it out. Peace. Generous Peace. It's that's a right. great yeah. video. It which really is, is a great video. video. Which is a translation <laughs> of, uh, yeah, which is a translation of Kareem Salama. So, yeah. 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 Not many people pick that up, to be honest. <laughs> it, it, it really is a great video. I, I must say I've been, I've, you know, from what it's about 10, 12 years old, at least maybe 13 years old. Right. Yeah. I think that uh, was my first video with a budget over $500. Nice. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to disclose the budget, but what I will say about Kareem is, you know, authentic in terms of like that, you know, like the Twain, the Southern Twain and everything. That's all, that's all real. That's not, that's not an, you know, it's not a fake act. Um, uh, it was just for me. It was hilarious, like seeing this like brown dude, Egyptian dude, like speak with this total hardcore right? <laughs> like Southern Texan accent, and and me being born and raised in Texas, like I had lost it just because I was kind of a virtual mutt because we moved around so much. Um, so I was like, wow, this guy's this is this is the real deal. So yeah. So Lena, I got to ask you. Uh, you talked about your origin story, but I, I, what I want to hear about is your relationship with comic books. Um, and I asked that as somebody who, since the age of maybe eight, nine, or ten, myself was totally into comic books. I, I picked them, picked up my first comic books at the local Seven Eleven, you know, everything, and then had like a ten year plus relationship with everything from GI Joe to Spider Man to to X Men and so forth. So I'd love to hear about your relationship. And the reason I'm asking is obviously if you if you watch the new movie, Ulysses, uh, Florian Ulysses, you see it. It, it opens with. Uh, reference to references to Silver Surfer and, and Wolverine and and so forth. So I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I grew up with two older brothers. One of which is a huge, huge comic book aficionado. Like, not just like he's not just a fan. Like, he knows it. He knows the whole world. He knows the philosophies. He knows everything. And and even before I think I knew I was getting into storytelling career wise. Like he used to like growing up. He would be telling me about like these kind of like deep personal struggles that these characters were doing. Like, like it wasn't just like, Oh, I'm so excited that he's going to be an ally with this guy. He'd like really be like, this is what Peter Parker is facing. These are like the demons that this other guy is dealing with, you know, anybody from like she Hulk to like anybody, you know? And so he, um, I, I know that that was always something that really was intriguing to me. And so I can't say I'm as big of a fan as him. Um, and I did do a lot of research for this movie and he helped me a whole bunch, <laughs> um, but I think that's what I was always attracted to. And I, I, I was a huge X-Men fan growing up, which has always kind of been close to what I've been excited about, which is like the way they, they weave in like a social commentary into comics. It's brilliant. Like before we were able to figure out how to do it well on film comics, we're doing it. And I think that is just astoundingly amazing. 
Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that Parvez and I always say, uh, as well as Zucky, the, the uh, mm-hmm. former host of the show, we always talk about how we're just like spoiled right now, right? Back when we were kids, we had to wait five years between maybe one comic book movie. And now it's, it's, it's uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Now it's like, you know, complete, complete opposite, complete, uh, completely spoiled. So it was really cool to see the references in the movie to all the comic, uh, comic characters and so forth. Yeah, like like uh, Disney Plus made us wait a week, bef- like between Marvel shows, and we almost lost our collective cool. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> we are we are totally spoiled. Speaking of Disney Plus, um, uh, and Marvel, <laughs> so uh, I, I will get there, Lena. I definitely want to pick up that thread uh, in terms of uh, Disney Plus and the movie and whatnot. But um, yeah, if you don't mind, I mean, I think um, you know, taking us back to the days after the release of Tiger Hunter, and I think the critical response, the commercial response. Uh, being overwhelmingly overwhelmingly positive, um, I love the movie. I, I, I remember the conversation you and I had about it the last time, which was that you know it was like my father's story on t- on you know on the big screen, and, and that was just so so gratifying, you know, to uh, to 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 sort of see that experience. Um, but um, I, if I recall that now, that was a movie where you had to kind of almost like crowdsource a portion of it, et cetera. Um, so kind of maybe pick us like, yeah, like I said, pick up the thread from there. Um, I crowdsourced maybe like 10, 20% of the budget. And the rest of it was going around the country for like eight, nine months and finding venture capitalists, investors, whoever would give us money to make up yeah. the rest of it. Right. Yeah, that's, I mean, obviously, I would imagine a very different experience than making Flora and Ulysses. So, um, so I guess, well, yeah, yeah, like, like I said, I mean, what sort of happens after the Tiger Hunter released? Yeah, so it released, I mean, we're, we're going for, you know, six, seven months chasing down a distribution deal, which is like, we kind of first had to go through the whole festival circuit, like get more awards and this and that, and then we started getting buzzed. But when it came out, um, it was good. I mean, it was, it was, we had the a rollout in theaters across the country and we got to learn a lot too, which was very exciting because it was exciting and also very frustrating because we knew what kind of audience the movie should have. And it's interesting because that was still a time where if you had movies that had brown people, they thought, well, surely a, a hefty portion of it is going to be brown person audience, which actually wasn't the case for us. So where it did really well was places where that just were just honestly like regular theaters. And then they tried in some cities to put it into sort of like where they play like the Indian movies, where it did not do well. They're, they're like, oh, you know, it's brown people and it does have a song in it. And so it was kind of um, for me when I look back, I was like, that was sort of like a moment in this journey of like, you know, brown people in cinema where like we can have normal movies without people thinking, well, surely it must be playing in the, in the Desi theater, you know, Um so anyways, it, it came out. We we got um, our Netflix deal, which was really big for us, um, you know, where it could play, you know, across the world and in, and in the States. And then now, like, everybody could see it. When it came out um, in theaters, I got signed, like, right away almost. And then things were very different. Then I had people helping me, and that was that was kind of like a big life changer for me. When you say you got signed, I mean, again, for those who may not have the industry knowledge, like, what does that mean? Like, you get signed by an agent? You get yes, signed by a yeah. studio? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so that, so that is like, so when you're like, in the stages of young person filmmaker dreaming, right? It's like, okay, I'm in college, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I made a music video, and I'm excited by that. Then your next stepping stone is like, I'm going to make a movie. I remember at the time, Kossum had made Muslim. And I was like, oh, I would just love in my life to make a movie, like a whole movie. I would be amazed by that. And so then make a movie. And then like this, this next step is like, uh, when I, so when at the first run, when the movie first came out, I think even actually at a festival, there was a whole bunch of people in very fancy suits off on the side. And they're like, Hey, we'd love to have a meeting with you. And they were from CAA. CAA is the biggest talent agency in, in Hollywood. And, That's and right. for like a young filmmaker, you go to the CAA building, which they call the Death Star, and it is like you're um, you're an entourage. Like you're like you're looking up at this place, and you're like, I have arrived. Where am I in this real surreal fantasy? And so from then on, you have these people who are always in these suits, and they are they are working for you and like sending you on meetings. It's suddenly like you have a key to meet people at all kinds of different studios, production companies, all those sorts of things. So it's um it's it's a huge game changer in like young filmmaker world. And real quick, I want to ask, I want to ask, like, in that moment, 
that time between the the movie coming out and that that big win, that big game changer moment for you, was there a window there where you were like, okay, how's this how's this going to be received? I'm kind of nervous. I'm not here. Or was it like, it sounds like it was more immediate than that, right? It sounded like oh, it happened Oh, no, the there was always that worry. There was like, oh my gosh, reviews are coming out. Oh no, will they like it? Oh no, no, it's, it's so nerve. It's, it's nerves like the whole time. Even then, like when you're signed, you're like, okay, they're really excited about the movie. Like, did they watch the same movie I saw? <laughs> <laughs> like, how long is this going to last? And then, um, it, it's weird. Yeah, it's, um, it, it did well generally, but like the like industry wise people are really excited when they see it and so i'm always like i don't know what's happening but i'll take it yeah yeah like was there any kind of palpable response from say the south you know like south south asian community indian community muslim community and if so like how does that like you know trickle up if you will or 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 i guess trickle you know yeah how, how do you sort of have a have a have an ear for that um, the response from the South Asian community now is a lot stronger than it was then. Then it's because like that South Asian community is so slow to just get out and do anything. <laughs> so like getting them out to theaters or getting them to press play on a Netflix thing or this and that. They're like, I'll get to it. I'll get when they get to it. They're very excited and this and that. But they're a slow burn demographic, man. <laughs> and then, so at that time, we're just like, all right, I don't know. We we'll just move on to other things. But I mean, it's. So I don't know, to answer your question, I don't know that I felt the effects. I mean, I feel support now. Um, okay. It's not like they weren't supportive, but I don't want to say it was like the big, huge thing because it was like pulling teeth sometimes to be like, just open the email. <laughs> so. I mean, surely I think uh, Netflix has an idea of the demographic because, I mean, you just see the kind of explosion in terms of content that is tailor-made almost for the South Asian community, right? I mean, in terms yeah. of so many Netflix originals. Um like I think, speaking of Tiger, there's the, of course the Tiger Hunter, but I think there's a recent release called the White Tiger or something like that. Yeah, I, yeah, 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 right. And so, which is more, I guess, yeah, like Bollywood meets uh, like serious Hollywood drama. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think Netflix realizes kind of by algorithm, like who who's watching and what they're watching and what they want more of. Yeah, possibly. I don't. Um... Netflix plays it a little close to the vest in terms of releasing a lot of their information about demographics and this and that. I do know from the early days that we actually weren't playing as strongly to the South Asian market as other ones. It was playing just like kind of like more, you know, indie coming of age story fair with some splash of South Asian demographic. That might be more now, but um, yeah, I know when the, it, that's, that's how it was at the time. No, so no what happens right. then? What happens then? Okay. So a, they, they, they contact you. They're like, showing interest how do you then how do you then proceed is it that they're giving you like a menu to choose from or do you have to is it then incumbent on you to pitch ideas and they're like just willing to listen to you further what's the next what happens after that you mean after you've been signed yeah 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 so they um first they send you to like a whole bunch of general meetings just to get you like out there talking to all the you know, all the big studios X and see that. So they just know you and they know you, which ones you don't take a liking to. They'll start thinking of you when they have scripts. So nowadays, for instance, you know, people will go like people I met like a year ago, they'll be like, Hey, we had this script. We remembered Lena for, you know, we really want to find something to do with her. Um, and then, yeah, it's definitely you coming up with your own material. Like that's when I was um, selling some TV shows and things like that. And so that way, now when you actually have an idea, they'll be the ones who'll make the calls they'll, you kind of have to get vetted through them first. <laughs> and, then, and then they'll be like, Hey, we got this. I have a client. They have this really great show idea. Um, we want you to come and listen to it. And then you're out like pitching to NBC and ABC and things like that. Wow. Stressful. I'm sure. <laughs> it's stressful. It was a little exciting. Yeah. Yes, yeah, definitely stressful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you have, have you, have you had a few, do you have a, maybe, maybe uh, you had a few ideas from like, 10 years you were sitting on that you got to finally share with the world. Is that how it is? Or did you have to feel pressured to like come up with something completely based on what you were hearing? No, it's a mix of both. I did find that people are really excited as they are now. Like I have a project that is, you know, we're working on right now that has nothing to do with me, but I found a way to have kind of like personal things come through in it. Like they love things that feel like you are the only person who can tell the story. Like, like, so if I could feed off of like one of the characters, like I have one thing that my, one of my characters is based off of like my brother. One of them is based off of like this, my wedding planner. Like I have a show, like I'm like, 
there's a lot of things where I just like feed off of crazy people I know and make those into stuff. And they just love hearing those sort of like anecdotes and stories and things. Cause they can start seeing kind of like the world that that show or movie is going to be. So, I mean, to me, it's fascinating then like from this world of like, I guess speed dating or whatever, right. Where you're <laughs> meeting like all these different executives and whatnot. Like, I guess take us to the journey of like where Disney comes across your, like you're sitting across from Disney and what that looks like or what even leads to that. So for that one, so now I had, I had an agent and I had a manager. My manager's fantastic. She sent me a script from somebody named Gil Netter. Gil Netter was my producer. I adore him to death. He's been one of the biggest mentors in my career now. He, he did things like Just Mercy, My Best Friend's Wedding, like Life of wow. Pi. He's doing The Alchemist right now. Like he does um, very large things. And so he's, he's doing a huge like $200 million movie at, at Disney right now too. But anyways, he had a script that he was developing on his own based off of a book with one of the original writers from Arrested Development, who I adore. His name is Brad Copeland. And so they sent me the script. So he already had a spec script for Flora and Ulysses. Spec meaning they haven't set it up anywhere yet. They just wrote it for the love of like, we want to get this made. Um, which when a established writer is writing a spec script, it's because he really loves it. Like otherwise writers are like, no, you got to pay me first. So we have it. And so she sent me a script. She's like, what do you think? And it was so funny. And, and I was like, I didn't think I'd be doing this sort of movie, but it's, it, it was funny and I love it. And so I went and I pitched first to Gil. And it was kind of like, you're pitching, but you're not. So you have to kind of make it sort of casual <laughs> and this and that. And so he brought me on board formally. And so then we developed a formal pitch and we went out pitching to like Fox and Amblin and Disney and all those sorts of things. A couple of them wanted it and we ended up going with Disney. That's how that worked. Wow. Wow. That's exciting. That's I'm sure that was a super exciting process and, and finally getting to, to the point where it was green lit, right? Yeah, we were waiting so then, for like forever. <laughs> so then maybe like if you could then share what was it about the script that intrigued you or that 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 you thought okay, this is the story that I would love to tell. Um I had a few things. One was just the type of humor. I, I loved the comic stuff and I thought you could make a lot of a lot of layers in a different world. I love the sense of humor in it. Obviously there are certain things in working with Disney that we made a little like you know, different, but it just it had a um he, he for what he could in a family movie, he threw in that arrested development humor. It, w it has its own sort of like charm. It's not cutesy. It's funny. Right. Um, and so, and so that was one thing. And I loved that. I love that. It, and this was something I was really big with on Disney. And I defended it until the very end when sometimes they like, why don't we make it? Is that it wasn't just like, Oh, a family gets together. It's really about these people who have been, you know, who've been broken by the world and how they get back up again. And I personally resonated with that a lot. And then um, just being a chance to sort of like build a world in, in, in a larger budget. Um, I, I wanted to, I told Disney, I was like, I'd like to make something that sort of feels like a live action Pixar movie, which hasn't been done. It's sort of, it's not, it's grounded in terms of the characters, but it's a, you know, it's building a world. It's kind of like this hybrid world, the way 500 days of summer is slightly heightened. Um, and I was so, I was excited for all of those things. <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, I guess uh, for those again not in the know in terms of how this how these things work, uh, what is the level of insight you have um, uh, in, into the uh, casting process as a director? Uh, I mean, you're you're very involved. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so it's not like sometimes I mean, when you because I ask that because Matilda Lawler who who plays Flora, I mean she is she is just amazing. Um, it took you know, us so long to find her. <laughs> I bet. I bet. But what a find. I mean, she's so great in the movie. Um, and then, of course, you have veterans like, you know, Allison Hannigan and stuff playing the mom. And uh, I, I, I don't know if I, 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 I don't know Ben Schwartz from other stuff, but I, I know I've seen him. I just can't place, you know, but he was great, too. And so, yeah, like ben I love Schwartz, him. like comic genius. He has this improv show that he does with Thomas Middleditch. It's on Netflix right now. There's a series of three of them and he does them live all the time. He is so good. I, I feel like there's going to be something huge. Like in the comic world, people know him really well. He always like um, fixes up people's scripts and their things, and he's just very sharp. But anyways, uh, casting like so when you're when you're a director for TV, for instance, you don't have as much say in casting. In movie, um, your point of view is very very important the whole way through. So they they do take that seriously. Obviously, there's people that as a studio they're going to just be like no, <laughs> and they'll do that, and they'll definitely you know 
want to make sure that we're all on the same page, but they will try to find somebody that you're safe at. So for Matilda, we had to see over a thousand girls across the world. And as there's a point wow. where we're like, we don't know whether we can make this movie. We haven't found her yet. Um, my casting director um, was um, Emily Schwaber was great. The weird thing about Disney is, is, you know, they want, they want the director to have, you know, kind of man the ship uh, creatively, but you know, they always want to be in the, in the know. So you actually in Disney have to send over your top three choices for the role. And so we had, and you have to do this whole like screen test and this and that, and you send it and you send it to like the highest, you know, highest of high of the company. You send it, to, they can refer to them as the Allens to the Allens and Sean Bailey. And so I sent three girls and then they called me and I was like wigging out over in Vancouver where we were right now uh, at that point. And I was like, only one of these girls will work. Like, I don't know what to do. They better <laughs> pick the same girl. And so they call me, Sean Bailey calls me and he's with the other execs. And he's like, Oh, you know, we just wanted to know what your thoughts were. And I was like, I can't imagine this movie with anybody except for Matilda. And then my producer's like, why did you say that? They're calling me now. <laughs> and he's like, not them, but some of the other execs. Like, apparently you're not supposed to use, you're not supposed to do that because then it's like, they're going to feel like if they pick somebody else, the director doesn't have faith that they can carry the movie through. So I had to write an email and be like, I'm just a very excited person. I really believe in Matilda, but we can make it work and do something wonderful with the other two as well. And so luckily though, um, even though everybody thought they were going to go with the really cutesy girl, which I was like, I will die if they take the cutesy girl. This is not that type of movie. Um, they picked a, uh, Sean picked Matilda. Um, and so from there I was very happy. <laughs> and then in terms of just the experience itself, I, this is presumably a much larger budget. I mean, for sure than, uh, than, um, your previous experiences. Right. And you have, um, you have this machine like Disney, right. Massive, massive company behind you. Like what's that? Out, out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> Completely different than where you had to crowdfund and go up around the country and, uh, you know, independent, smaller film, right? Just tell, tell us about just the differences uh, aside from maybe the, the day-to-day -day food on, uh, on site and so forth. Right. <laughs> it was, um, it was very, very freeing about not having to, you know, deal with anything except for the creative. That was amazing. You know, not having like when I was doing Tiger Hunter, I was doing the website and I was finding the this and I was doing that. Um, this one, it was so cool to just like literally just have to do your one job. Um, and then it was ridiculously stressful <laughs> because everybody knows, especially as like a female filmmaker, it's like, well, they've handed you this giant film that is like hugely bigger than your other film and you better not screw it up. And so that was just, just weighing on you for the entirety of the whole time that you're making it. And it never goes away. Um, but I mean, to their credit, when they, when they backed me to do this film, they told everybody at the company, they're like, we're going to give her the best resources to support her vision. And they did. Like the crew was fantastic. Everybody, you know, it's like you just had to sort of dream something, obviously within the budget, and they'll figure out and help you get the tools to make it happen. You know, you want to do some word of random like CGI sequence? Sure. You know, you don't haven't done CGI before. OK, we'll teach you. So I'm really curious. I know these productions are, are very quick moving, intense um, uh, a couple of weeks or months, right? Tell us a little about that. Is it's? I know it's not a nine to five job, <laughs> Monday through Friday. It's, it's probably twenty four seven to some degree. Maybe you can tell us about that experience. Um, my producer would always say that we are working twenty four eight, or at least I was, because <laughs> it was a compliment he gave when he, he helped me uh, later on. He'd tell people how it was for us working together. I'd be like, you know, always works twenty four eight, but that was just like a requirement of. Um, it was insane. I've never. I it, it was of the hardest times of my life. <laughs> like just, just, well, it's also cause I had, um, I had a baby. Um, so it was just super insanity, but even without that, it, it's, uh, you know, you're, just, you're working all day, you're working all night. Um, you're working like when you're shooting, you're running around all day long. And then afterwards we'd be spending hours, um, in wardrobe, figuring out wardrobe that we hadn't yet figured out for two weeks for, for the week after. So it was like from, we didn't have enough time in development. We just kind of like went into it. So during pre-production, we're doing development at the same time. So you're staying up at night, figuring out like problems to like script development stuff. And then you're just running and gunning it while you're shooting and doing what you can in the time that you have um, up until you're done pretty much. Like, wow. It was like, I can't remember there's ever a break. And, no. and tell me it wasn't like Ramadan or something on top of that, right? <laughs> it was Ramadan for part of it. Wow. I somehow wow. always seem to shoot movies during Ramadan. It literally yeah. always happens. <laughs> so. Amazing. Uh, now, 
I, and I guess, I mean, since we are talking about production, um, does, does the pandemic hit while you're filming or after? The pandemic hit, I, I was getting ready to go shoot more stuff in Vancouver when lockdown happened. Like we were packing, running around town, finding hand sanitizer because our friends and family and our, um, whatever focus group screenings had done really well. And Disney was giving us more money to just like shoot more extra funny stuff. Um, and so pandemic happened and then we did everything from then remotely. Um, we were working remotely. Luckily they still gave us the money, but then we had to figure out really creative ways to like mishmash footage. We already had mix it with a little CGI and use that money to do other funny stuff. Uh, and, and you have mentioned CGI a couple of times now. I, I'm curious then, uh, being relatively new, I imagine, um, to CGI and productions involving uh, a lot of CGI, um, how was that process like? Like, how, how does that affect you as a creative, uh, I imagine, with green screen and so on, like having to have your actors respond to things that aren't there? that are going to be, you know, added on in post. I mean, Ulysses, you know, like Ulysses is obviously an entirely CGI creation. Like how does that, like, how does that impact you as a, as a filmmaker, as a creative? Yeah. And, and, you know, it's weird because I'd never done CGI and I was very nervous of that, about that before going in, in some ways it's not as half as bad as it seems like they make it. It's really about you knowing what you want to accomplish creatively and people are there to help you along the way. And, and in terms of like, they just, they all need answers for you all the time. You there, you're answering 500 questions a day. You need to know what you're looking for and then they will help. And so like, like for instance, designing and Ulysses, like, you know, first I have to like, I came up with like a bunch of reference things and like certain qualities I want all the way to the, which was, I thought was really fun. The, so there's people in other, in like Montreal and India who are Korea, who are doing all the, actual CGI for the character under, under our visual effects supervisor. And they're, they're following your direction, like very specifically things, even like when he's going to flick his tail, you know, is stuff we're telling them. And then they ask like personality things. They're like, well, I was like, well, you have to get his personality, right? I was like, he is like um, Andy in parks and recreation. Like he sort of has this like lack of impulse control, very excited about things. And, you know, he's going to grow into, Chris Pratt and guardians of galaxy. Like, so you have to, like, get that, you have to get that right. And they, they did for a lot of the time, but like, and then, you know, obviously there's por- portions where like, it was a learning experience for me. And I, I go back and I was like, I wish I knew what I knew now to do it again. Because like, you are like, when you're filming things, you're filming things like with nothing, there's not a stuffy there half the time. It's just like blank. Like you're, you're looking at grass. And so you don't know until you've done the whole thing about like certain things that you should have looked out for. And like, you know, there's even like little things like, when Matilda is interacting, they're all interacting with something that doesn't exist. And and so I had a little puppet and I would puppet in for him. I would like pretend to do a voice, even though Ulysses doesn't have a voice in that way. And then, but like little things that you, you don't realize how important they are until later. Like when you look at a real animal, like a puppy in your hand, your eyes just move a little. They don't just like fixate on something. But right. when you're looking at even like a gray stuffy, which sometimes they used for her in her hand, like your eyes tend to fixate. So you have to be on the lookout for all those things while you're also looking for performance and get back in there. Sometimes I'd be like leaning underneath the gray stuffy and pretending to be like Ulysses underneath and stuff. Um, but a lot of credit goes to Matilda because she's just a fantastic actress. So. Yeah. 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 That was great. And, and I mean, yeah, it, of course we're at a, we're in a world where, special effects are seamless and, you know, so spot on. So, um, yeah, no, no moments where you're kind of taken out of the, uh, out of the action or, or out of the proceedings. So, um, kudos <laughs> on, <laughs> on your first uh, maiden voyage with regards to using heavy CGI. Um, so I, 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 I can't help but ask like also like in terms of interacting with Disney and whatnot, like obviously Disney is, right now in the middle of um, production, I think on another big, um, you know, Muslim and uh, it's like, yeah, like, like, like Muslim character, um, uh, Miss Marvel, that is. Um, I, I was wondering if you got any like sort of sneak peeks or kind of a look behind the curtain, just out of, just out of sheer curiosity or any other sort of intersection or, there? Or, uh, or and, and, and even just broadly speaking, like, what was it, what was it like as a Muslim to work for, Disney. I mean, maybe, maybe it was in, maybe there's really nothing to say there, or maybe there's some unique experience. And, and, and also, and this is maybe another question, um, uh, but I know Disney's been doubling down on diversity and 
you know, you know, voice giving voice to, 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 to more types of creators and characters and so forth. I mean, you see it, you see it in their shows, you see it, it's, it's, it's evident, right? So I don't know if you have any, anything, um, any experience there, anything you would notice that you'd like, you can share. No, I don't know how much my being a Muslim, like was something I noticed so much while I was going in there. Um, but, um, it was exciting there. And when I came around Muslims who were on, um, the lot and things like that, they were super psyched to see me. Um, and it was, yeah. it, it was cool. Like, like it, it, it's, it's cool to see Disney trying to do a lot more multicultural stuff. I mean, one of the biggest things is like, you know, my, a good friend of mine, um, Mari Bangi, she, um, she's just become vice president of multicultural strat- multicultural strategies at Walt Disney studios. It's a huge role. Like wow. that's like a Muslim oh, wow. person who's been doing amazing work in the field um, and elevate her in that way. And um, you know, sh- her, her company was very instrumental, a company she used to be the head of um, in like, there's going to have an Eid episode for that. Um, what's that cartoon? Mira, Mira, the Royal detective, I think they're going to have an Eid episode. And for all of my life, I don't think I've ever seen an Eid episode of anything. <laughs> you know? so, yeah. uh, that, is a, that is a big deal, you know? And so um, all, all that stuff is, is really exciting in that way. I mean, Miss Marvel, I have, I'm not allowed to say anything for of course. Of I know course. that my friend it's, it's, it's kind of exciting for me. Well, besides the fact that I really, really wanted to be involved, I had it like I had everybody excited for me, but when they thought they were going to film Miss Marvel, I was still in post-production and I kept begging like my manager. I was like, everybody is making calls saying they're excited for like, can, can you figure out something? And they're like, no, you're, you're, you're still in post-production. Like, they won't, they can't delay either schedule. And I was like, and then I was, and then a pandemic happened and I was like, I could have been involved. This sucks. Uh, but <laughs> I'm very excited that it has happened. My, um, somebody I went to film school with, like I, who I used to do short films with is actually the um, art director on Miss Marvel. And so it was really cool. Like she gave me a call and she's like, Hey, you want to tap your brain about some like South Asian Muslim things? I'm like, why? <laughs> and so it was, um, they're taking it very seriously and it's, it's, it's coming along cool. I, I can't say anything more than that. Sweet. We are looking we forward are, to it for sure. We, yeah, we are. We are very excited. Uh, and, and I mean, you know, just to, I, like going back to this point of like diversity inclusion, um, you know, it's, it, it is so important. And, and as like Umar, Umar has got, Umar is the father of two daughters. I have two daughters and just being able to share with them, you know, I remember sitting down and watching, you know, Flora and Ulysses with them and just telling them, like showing them a picture of you and being like, okay, this is the person behind the lens. This is Lena who's directing this. And then of course now with Miss Marvel coming out, like representation matters. And um, like you mentioned the name of your a friend who's going to be head of diversity. Um, uh, that's amazing. Like, you know, again, all of those things matter. And I think, uh, especially for people growing up, um, you know, like our kids generation, that's going to be invaluable, you know, and I hope yeah. that they truly kind of cherish and how, how invaluable that is because we didn't grow up with it, Lena, like you said, you know, like we would be starved or the idea of like a Ramadan, uh, sorry, Eid episode, you know, completely eludes us. This is kind of random, but there, there was an episode. I mean, I'm 44, um, and so I grew up watching 80s sitcoms like Growing Pains and Family Ties, <gasps> Who's the Boss and all, right? <laughs> so, uh, but there was a moment in Growing Pains, I remember, and literally it was like a three-second random brown person <laughs> saying something, and it was like something we talked about for weeks afterwards, right? So that's what we had, um, to, and, and now it's a completely different world. And I noticed, I definitely noticed in, in the movie um, you know, visibly Muslim characters in the background. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. In the middle of Vancouver, which was hard to, um, it's weird how it's hard to find diversity in Vancouver. You really have to like, be like, no guys, we're going to do this. Surely you can find some people who look like different colors. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but no, it is very exciting. Yeah, but, yeah. but, you know, and again, having you and having someone like you or you yourself behind the, you know, behind the camera, I mean, that matters because you have an eye for that. Right. I mean, whereas another filmmaker just may not, they, may, they, they, they just may not even have an eye for something like that. Yeah. I noticed that's a, it's a huge difference when, especially like producers and directors, uh, people of, of minority communities are, are being, it's like, it's like the diversity comes without you having to like try for it. Like, I think people think like, Oh, you're doing some sort of like affirmative action for like minorities. It's not like that. What happens is 
you don't see the barriers that other people see. Like I've noticed, like I'm in the room sometimes where like another person without them even like thinking it will see somebody, maybe they'll see like an Asian guy or maybe they'll see whatever it is, like, you know, somebody, and and they'll only see them vis-a-vis like that identity, that part of their identity. Whereas Mm -hmm. like we see these people all the time. And so you're like, okay, that guy's funny (laughs) or that guy's whatever, you know, you don't, you don't have those barriers that are, that are pigeoning holding them before you even get to see their talent. I mean, you do, everybody has unconscious bias, but I'm going to say we have a little less of it. (laughs) Yeah. 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 No, and I think you make a great point. I mean, I, and I was going to ask you about this regardless, uh, but I think it's, it's just a great time to bring it up, which is, you know, you work with Danny Putty again, right? And uh, so like how, like, and again, he's just there because he's a great, you know, comedic performer. Uh, he's not there because he's Asian or anything like that. And so like, how, how was that? Like, how did that come together? Was that something that you like specifically asked for? Like, I'd love to work with Danny again. Um, uh, you know, for, again, for those who may not have seen Tiger Hunter, he is your lead character there um, or lead actor. Um, I'd love to hear about that. I mean, as someone who is a fan of Parks and Rec and as a fan of seeing him in Marvel movies. <laughs> yeah. Then, yeah. yeah. Danny is a gem. He is so good. He's doing something coming up with John Hammond. I'm very excited. He, I think he's just like this. I, I, he's one of those people who I, I will say, given like the time that he was so amazing that had he not been a Brown guy, I'm certain he would have gotten a lot farther because, you know, for instance, my movie was the first chance that he could actually even just be like somewhat of a love interest or, you know, get roles that and and, he wasn't, and I'm sure he would have gone farther if it wasn't for, you know, him being seen in a certain way. But as far, as far as this movie, um, we had a role and, you know, for those who've seen the movie, like he's the antagonist and he's a little bit more of a, like the character on paper is pretty much like a dog catcher. Like he's an animal control agent. And I was like, I was like, guys, I cannot do this. Like I cannot have some random actor who's doing the typical, like, I'm the animal control guy and I must get the, 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 I was like, we need to give him a little pizzazz and then like ground him or give him a backstory or make him something, make him a human. And I was like, the only person who can make him a human and still make him fun is Danny Pudi. And I was like, like, so, so they were all really psyched about the idea. He ended up being like the most beloved of the most beloved um, characters. Like over the, like, like when he left, my whole crew was sad. They're like, Oh, well, Danny's not here today. <laughs> I'm like, oh. I, I know. And so we joke that we have a, um, there's a clause in our both of our contracts now that he must be in every movie I ever make, and and I hope to make that happen. <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. And I, and by the way, I, I I misspoke. I had Parks and Rec in my head because you said it earlier. Um, of course, Danny is from Community, and, and uh, they must have lo- like the Russo brothers loved him so much they had him in Winter Soldier. And so yeah, I I, I misspoke. I, I mentioned Parks and Rec, <laughs> and I should have said Community. He's great in that, um, and that is hilarious. Um. And, and yeah, it was just great seeing, like, for example, I hadn't seen Janine Garofalo in something in so long. <laughs> so it was like, oh, my God, is that Janine Garofalo? Like, it was yeah. just, you know, little, little things like that. Um, so I guess. And, uh, and Horatio, Horatio Sands, I believe, with the guy from SNL, right? In the beginning, yeah, the comic, right. comic book owner. Yeah. So this is a lot that's of. Bob, that's Bobby Moynihan. Oh, Bobby Moynihan. That's right. I got this. Yes. Yeah. Bobby Moynihan's yeah. great. Yeah. He's SNL, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes, SNL, yeah. yeah. SNL, awesome. and he's like the comic book guy. He is the quintessential comic <laughs> yes. book guy. Like, uh, whether you walked off the pages of like the you know like the Simpsons or, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that was great. Um, so I guess tell us like wh- what has it been like since the release? Uh, you know, how, like what have obviously the the reviews have been great. Um, you know, but what has it been like for you? Like in terms of uh, yeah, once like the movie is released as it were, or at least, uh, you know, dropped on Disney plus. <laughs> uh, it's been insane. I mean, it did really well. There was times when it was like second or third, I forgot, like one of the top, um, streamed movies in the world of that week. And I was like, Oh my God, what is happening? Um, so no, it was really, really good. And then obviously a lot of people in the industry have been reaching out. So it's, um, it's been very crazy and very weird and cool at the same time, because now it's like, being a little pickier, but it's, I, I don't know. It, it's, it's good. It's good. And it's overwhelming all at the same time. <laughs> well, that, that, that is awesome to hear and, and well-deserved of course. Um, but I, I guess I have a question and I don't know how much insight you have into this, but like as someone who is rather ill-informed when it comes to how these streaming services, um, you know, like what they, like what metrics are used for a hit versus a movie that was, a, is a dud or what have you, like how much insight do you have into that process? Like you mentioned, like it was the second most downloaded movie in the world, but like 
beyond metrics like that, how is the studio, how are these streaming services kind of measuring success? It kind of varies um, based off of the different streaming services. So, you know, Netflix wants to make sure that you feel like they have stuff on there that like that everybody has to have a, you know, a Netflix account, you know, Disney's trying to offer things that you're not getting somewhere else. And they also want to make sure um, Disney's, Disney's metro Disney also wants repeated viewing nowadays because they're not um, they're still building, you know, their library and things like that. And so for instance, people have been watching um, Florian Ulysses like multiple, multiple times. And so that's a big coup for them because like first people watch it first, they, 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 told, they and, and all of these people play it very close to the best in terms of like what information they give. But um, you know, they did for instance, mention that like we were bringing in a lot of, um, I forgot they have a, is it a walk adults without children viewers? Oh, and, wow. so, and so like they have names like that. I don't know if that was exactly it was something like that. And they're like, they're bringing, we're bringing in that, that demographic. And so like, which was exciting. And so they're, um, and as well as like, obviously their, their biggest thing was families, but particularly they wanted to be not just children, but families, um, which it was doing well for. And so like, so they'll share certain things. It just, they don't give as many numbers. Even the numbers that we found were from like my agents found them from other places like Nielsen, et cetera, but they don't give them themselves. Like Netflix and Disney are very particular about that. And for instance, Hulu's looking for different things. They wanted to feel like, okay, they're the more like niche cool in a different way sort of thing. They're not, they don't think they're going to get like the entire market share that like Disney or Netflix is. So they, so they all have different things they're going for. Um, they measure minutes. It's a really good point you make about repeat viewing. Like, it's kind of cool that, you know, something you created could be watched by the next generation, maybe the next generation after that. Because, you, you know, when, when something's on Disney, it, it kind of lives there forever at that point, yeah. right? Um, yeah. I started embracing because, you know, at the beginning when we were still making the decisions about, you know, I can't get into too much about, the, about like, whether it'll be theatrical or this or that and the pandemic, you know, decided everything anyway. Like, obviously, you know, as a filmmaker... Growing up when we did, everything's like theatrical. I started to embrace the, um, I don't know, there's some very exciting things about streaming, just besides the fact about like the m- millions of people who see it, but just like the fact that it like endures for so long. Like this, if Netflix, if Tiger Hunter wasn't on Netflix, we wouldn't have like, it was the most popular, it was on the like, you know, popular section on Netflix, like recently. And we're like, it's been years since it came out. Like it, it just got discovered. It's funny, it got discovered because of Tiger King people were accidentally typing in it and going to Tiger Hunter. <laughs> and we suddenly started getting all these new, these articles about how like this hidden gem on Netflix. I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> so, but like, if it was like stuck on DVD, like nobody's going to be watching it years later, but that'll happen when you're on a streaming service. Yeah. There's like a long burn and, and yeah, you can have these kind of resurgence of an uptick in terms of uh, downloads or, or viewers. Yeah. It's super cool. I never thought of that. Um, so I, I guess, uh, like, any thoughts? I mean, f- again, this is kind of broadening beyond just the film, like, or even streaming in general. But kind of any thoughts on how you feel the pandemic? Um, you know, even with life returning back to normal and 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 what have you, and and movies going to be going back to the theaters. Like, what do you think the pandemic has altered or changed? You know, irrevocably. You know, in terms of where we are. I think the biggest way, and I, I'm hoping it's not true, but I, we don't really know that the pandemic is affecting things is how it's going to affect theatrical viewing. I, it's been, a, we've been seeing it anyway before pandemic where theater go, the movies that were going to be theater movies were going to be those like giant tent pole movies and like regular movies that people, you know, still like, and you see a lot of them still do well, might just be something that you're watching streaming and at home. And I think now that people have sort of embraced that through the year, we're seeing that for sure. And I, I'm hearing it from, from production companies and studios and things like that, that, you know, they're going to, they're almost going to follow the sort of Disney model that like the giant tent poles are going to be that and movies that they still want to want to make. And they can be anywhere from like, you know, 10 or, or it could be a movie that's like $40 million, $50 million. And it's still going to be a streaming movie, which is insane. Um, and it's just going to depend on, is it going to be that like giant, superhero movie or whatever and the rest are going to be kind of and then and then then theater prices might go up and it's like spielberg had a prediction like something like seven years ago that theater going is going to be like a very like special occasion outing where you know it'd be like 40 bucks a ticket (laughs) like a very special thing and you only go like once a year and i'm like i wonder if that's going to happen and something like that is heading this way 
Wow, that yeah, it's it's fascinating to see because I mean, uh, both Perez and I are huge movie buffs. We you know we love going to the theater, uh, but uh, you're you're right. I mean, like I grew up watching independent movies in the theater, and, and now it's like if you're gonna go, it's there's got to be a good, really good reason to, um, you know, just just from a from a from a cost perspective, from a time perspective, and it's the it tends to be the superhero movies or the big action type movies that that draw you right. Yeah. And it's a weird dynamic that the pandemic is even making worse, which is that people are, you know, so much more likely to watch a movie um, that's free. Even like the renting it is like three bucks or something like that. But I feel like the majority of people I know, they're like, oh, we have to buy that. I'm like, you know, it's three dollars and there's four of you watching it. It is not a problem. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's just a, it's such a weird thing. And so that means like people are getting steered to watch the majority of those things that are just the free ones. And sometimes the rented ones are, are very good. And I don't know, it's, it's yeah. all kinds of mess. <laughs> I wanted to ask one other thing too. We, we, we alluded it just when we were talking just before recording and I was, uh, I asked you, uh, what, you know, when you, when you finish one project and go to the other, is it like, is it like you just hand it off and you move in your mind, completely focuses gears it shifts gears to, to the new to the new project and, and you were commenting about that share that with the audience if you don't mind um yeah it's a little weird because you're just your your whole life it's like it's like another baby is this project for however long it is one year two year three years and then up until the moment that you hand it off you hand it off and then it comes back into your life you know maybe like some months or whatever later when you have to do a whole bunch of press and then it's your life again for like another month, two or whatever it is. And then once it's, you know, the press is, you know, fading out some or whatever it is and it's more manageable, then it's like you've, it's gone again. <laughs> like, and it was weird because um, like I was telling you, I sat down, some people were watching the tiger hunter and I used to have that movie memorized. I had seen it so many times when I was editing and now there were, there were certain things were happening. I was like, Oh, I wonder what's going to happen. Like, Oh my gosh. Like, and I really didn't remember. And so it's just, it's so strange in that way. Um, but yeah, after you're done, like it just depends. Like I, I usually have like many things going at the same time. So it's not necessarily like one thing yet until one is like literally like in production or pre-production. So right now I kind of have just like six things happening all at the same time. And it's all just uh, depends on, the vicissitudes of, of the industry, mm -hmm. which one's going to go first. Are there, uh, are there any things you can talk about uh, amongst those six? Are there anything I can talk about? Um, <laughs> even in theory, even in theory. The only one in theory I can talk about is one that's kind of been my, I think there's always the ones that are sort of like the bigger, whatever things. And one that's sort of my passion project. Mm -hmm. One of the, my passion projects is one of the bigger things that I'm allowed to talk about, but a smaller one is, um, that is, is, there's a, what is it? How do you describe that one? The shortest thing is it's a dark comedy about a magician with chronic depression, except it's a comedy. Like he goes on the tonight show at like the height of his career and he accidentally impales a volunteer's hand on live television. And then his career is over. And then there's anyways, it's crazy. He thinks his rabbit hates him as a rabbit funeral. There's like a weird ventriloquist dummy that it's, it's just a really weird out there thing. We got a writer. He's amazing. He, um, the New Yorker says he, they think he's invented his own writing style and only he knows how to write it, which I think is very cool. So I'm excited about that one. That's sort of like my baby. And then, but then I have some other babies that are in, you know, the different phases of film life nice. right now. Are, so are you sound, it sounds like you're really into the kind of the quirky comedy genre. Are, are there any specific other genres or that you're really passionate about? Like, are you into maybe biographical or historical or yeah horror or what I have you won a biopic uh, that I uh, actually right now so uh, sorry I, I just wanted to ask kind of piggybacking on what Omar just asked because uh, like this is what I was thinking about when you were describing the quirky comedy you're working on which is like what is like your what would be your dream project to be working on you know and so maybe kind of addressing that in conjunction with what Omar just asked um Miss Marvel in movie form was my dream project, but I don't think, I think it's going to be a while to that actually happens. Um, but I. Fingers crossed. I'm telling you. Season two in trouble. Season like two in trouble. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, in movie form. I think it would be cool to see that. Like, it's, it's different. I mean, I'm sure it's, it's, it's very exciting on, on Disney plus, but when things kind of have their, 
when they got kind of finally get to headline a movie, it's just treated very different and it's a different, a uh, whole different thing. Um, but anyway, uh, I like things that are smart. I don't know how to like, I got, I got, I've got sent like a couple things recently and my, my managers are like, why are you saying no to this? I was like, there's nothing I can do for this. Like it's cool and fun and this and that. I can't make it any deeper. I can't make it any richer. I can't make it any funnier. I can't make it anything. Like it is what it is. Um, and so I like things that just have things that you can push and you can just live in that world for, for forever. Sometimes it, I, a lot of them have been comedies, but that's only cause like a lot of the stuff that I've done is hopefully either it, I wanted to move the, the conversation forward a little or have some value for existing in the world. And so that means it needs to reach audiences. And a lot of the time you need to figure out like, what is the thing that's making it reach audience and not like die as an art house film? Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's maybe not my thing to have it like pure something that doesn't, I am looking for an audience so that people can like engage and, and, and see the story. And so comedy is a way that you can get people to a lot of stories that maybe, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't kind of traverse in those worlds otherwise. But like, for instance, like I wish I could have done Dallas Buyers Club. I think it is a amazing movie. I would love, I would have loved to do that. Um, that would, that would be a dream project. So it's really just depends what it is. There was a script going around. I think Fincher is producing and I would tell them, I was like, I'm so excited about this, but it was, it was before I'd even done a movie. So I had no chance of ever getting it. It was called the good nurse. I think it's about the most prolific serial killer of all time. And I just thought it was a very cool, but he worked in the hospital system. Wow. They called it, he, it's based off a true story. He was the angel of mercy. That's what he thought he was. And it, but there's just so much going on besides like these types of people that you don't realize they exist, but also like there's layers, you know, like the layers for like how somebody could get away with that was failures of the hospital system. And so there's just so many, like there's so much meat in there and you can make it like so much, like you can make thrilling, you can make it smart, you can make it so much stuff. So I get a lot of emails now from younger filmmakers, particularly Muslim ones who, you know, like, Oh, I want to get into the industry, this and that, you know, I want to do like so much good in this and that. And I'm like, that's great. But it's weird because you can't, when you are making movies and telling stories um, for like a larger audience, you can't lead with intention. And what I mean is that like you, you're doing an intention by deciding to do this work, but you can't have a story. Your intention will not make a story good. Like there has to be, that, that is the nature of why stories that are good reach so many people. Like people don't feel like they're being taught or they don't feel like they're being preached to. There has to be something very internal in you that is helping you tell that story. And so I think I've tried and I had to, and I had to go through those decision to do that for, for, for tiger hunter. Cause especially when people are like, like I'm going to enter Hollywood. I want to tell a story that has Muslims in it, this and that, you know, it's like, get it down to like, what is the story that you're telling and not what is the goal for which you're telling it, you know? And so for mine, you have to like realize that you are a Muslim, but you are also have so many, of a, a, ancillary aspects to your identity. And so you can use those in telling your story. And for this one, for instance, there was something for me that was very compelling about a story of a young man who was trying to live up to his father. Um, and I, I, I knew people in my family who had lived through that. And I understood certain things of that and this idea of success and how that could mean different things, you know? And so by making sure like to not just be like thinking with the Muslim part of my brain and telling the story. I think that's been helping um, in a lot of things. Cause like I do, for instance, one of the shows I sold uh, does have Muslims in it, but it's not, I'm hoping it's not preaching and this and that, because I wasn't even like thinking about the Muslim stuff too much while doing it. Like I'm excited, but it's really about these crazy characters and like the stuff they're going through and somebody sort of discovering, you know, herself and her path and things like that in, in a comedy. So Nice. Well, you, you teased a few really uh, exciting projects. We're, we're, we're going to be we're going to be keeping an eye on on, on the news <laughs> and, and seeing seeing what comes comes with those. Can't wait. Yeah, to, you know how the industry is, though. Like the industry, like you're working on these things, and suddenly something else comes. So it could end up being something else. Like, yeah, for two sure. months from now. So <laughs> definitely, very very exciting. Um, hey, Perez, you still there? Yeah. So yeah. I guess I, a great question to kind of maybe leave our listeners with, uh, Lena, is like, what well, what advice would you have for, you know, a young kind of, you know, um, bright eyed, uh, you know, uh, film student right now is sitting at UCLA or USC or anywhere else and, 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 and has dreams of, uh, you know, uh, taking Hollywood? Uh, you know, and again, specifically like like someone from a Muslim background, like, I guess what words of wisdom or experience you could share with that listener? 
Um, I think I used to say like six, seven years ago, and I hope, I think we graduated from it now that to be very, very, make very, very sure that things you're making are, are like actually good and not Muslim good. Like the way, you know, like we go to a burger place and we're like, man, this burger place is so good. And we're like, yeah, but is it like Muslim good? Because like you just, you're excited you found a halal burger place or is it like actually good? And so like a lot of the time, like, and I think we graduated beyond that too, but it's something we have to be really cognizant of when you're trying to get up there. Um, so that's one thing, like finding really, really good mentors is invaluable. Finding people who are going to tell you that your stuff sucks and, and that way you have to make sure to improve it. Like I'm a big, big proponent of the Simon Cowell philosophy of telling you like, if your stuff sucks, like your stuff sucks. And, and that way that person, like they have to decide, like, what are they going to do to fix it? You know? Yeah. And, like, and do they want it that bad that even though like, Hey, maybe it does suck, you know, or, or do they really feel like, no, it doesn't. And I believe in, it, and I'm going to take it all the way. Like you have to like know the world and know yourself. And, 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 and I think people don't, um, it goes a really, really long way. What kind of person you are. I, mean, I think we have this like image, like, and people don't think so, but you know, you're working with studios. Half of it is politics and they want to know, like, can I, can I spend this year working with you? Are we going to come up with something that is the best of our collaboration? Or is it going to be you being like t- a terrible human, like for that whole time, you know, until you really become like the highest of the highest. And there's only like, three or four directors, you know, that can like, get away with that. Like, no, yeah. like ev- everybody else can't, you know? And so you need to be a person of integrity, like things that you do stupid, two years prior, they're going to come back and bite you. And obviously, hopefully if you're like a faithful person, like I, I do believe that like you trying to do right in our equivalent of karma, you know, like God will, will kind of help you on your way. Cause you know, he's helped me in a lot of ways that I don't think he would have happened otherwise. And, and, and people, people see it. Like it really goes a very long way to be a person of integrity in an industry where often that is not the case. People see it. They want to work with you. They want to help you. It, it really does help. Yeah, absolutely. Integrity and passion and grit, I think, are uh, prerequisites for for the uh, the field you're in. But uh, well, we we've definitely super had a super great time on this conversation, and uh, really want to thank you for for the for the the insight and uh, sharing your experience and and uh, and, and uh, talking about the projects. Yeah, it was really fun. Always good to talk to you all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then for uh, the, for those of you who. Uh, haven't seen the tiger hunter check it out on streaming i believe netflix uh flora and ulysses is on disney plus and uh and you can uh, you watch the cream salama video on youtube <laughs> <laughs> so thank do you a, lena do, uh, a, do a whole deep dive into lena's catalog so yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> exactly <laughs> no but uh yeah I, I i echo uh omar's sentiment lena always great to have you and we look forward to having you back on after your next exciting project um you know, as always, thank you for listening, listeners. Uh, if you have any thoughts, questions, comments, feedback, we'd love it. Um, you can email us at, at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Uh, check out our Facebook page, facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. Uh, you can become a monthly patron uh, at patreon.com slash diffusecongruence. And, uh, yeah, look out for further episodes coming out. And uh, we are excited. Uh, we're right at the cusp of Ramadan, so we hope to have some good programming in store for you for Ramadan. So, um, but yeah, get, get your screenings in for, uh, for and Ulysses and Tiger Hunter, uh, before, um, before Ramadan. So, <laughs> uh, thanks again, Lena, for having, uh, for, for taking the time, um, you know, with family and everything else and, and for being on the show. I'm <laughs> <laughs>